We just settled in for a nice game of Planet Zoo when it became obvious to us we weren't going to enjoy it much. Planet Zoo, for those unfamiliar with the title, is one of those zoo sim games like Sim Zoo, in which you pretend to be the owner of a zoo who has the best interests of both the animals you feature and the people who come to look at them at heart. Really, of course, you're just trying to build an efficient economic engine so that when some numbers are subtracted each time the clock ticks, other numbers are added that are hopefully bigger. It's just that some of the numbers are made up to look like animals that occasionally die for no particular reason. This was not our problem with the game, though. We're completely used to things happening for no apparent reason that we can understand. That's called life. You'll just have to imagine us waving our hands at the world in general right now, but trust us, we're doing it. No, for us, the problem was a system in the game that should have been easily functional with no need to go into deep layers of shenaniganery in order to produce decent and reasonable results. Picture, if you will, two zoo enclosures. Say one contains the American bison, several members of, and the other contains an ever-growing number of prodigiously prolific peacocks. Both are contained within suitable enclosures, provided with food and water, as well as various bits of species-specific entertainments. They could not be happier, these peacocks and bison. Meanwhile, elsewhere in the zoo, a crowd of both the public and zoo employees are waiting to descend on these two zoo attractions. One to enjoy the educational materials provided and view the animals on display, the other to clean up after the first group and take care of the animals as needed. Let's say, for the sake of argument, both these groups of people are starting at the zoo entrance, the very first portion of the realm of which you now find yourself in absolute control. They haven't fully entered the zoo yet, but you are mere moments away from unpausing the game and letting them have at it. All that remains to do is to connect a stone path from the zoo entrance to the animal exhibits so people can move from one to the other. Now, there are any number of ways to create that stone path. Lots of games have lots of ways in which this is done. Some let you lay the path down as a series of quick and easy straight lines. Basically, you just paint the path where you want it to go and the game says, yes, sir, I shall put it just there exactly as you have instructed me. If it runs over anything it shouldn't, like bits of complicated terrain or other fixtures already installed, it'll light up red to let you know where the offending bit is and allow you to jigger things around until it's all sorted. Great, cool, easy, boom, path. Heard they had to bat an eye. Other games like a slightly more complicated arrangement. They allow you to lay the path down in increments, with each increment being adjustable so as to allow you to curve the path or raise or lower it. These sorts of games generally provide some sort of light assistance to provide paths with delicate curves that flow around obstacles. They have a bit of code that helps them to automatically match up with other bits of path already laid down if you so choose, which is always a bit of a trick with games that use a more freeform system rather than a grid. Great, cool, easy, boom, path. A touch more eye-batting than the other way, but still useful. And then there's Planet Zoo's system. The designers of Planet Zoo seem to feel that the animals and people and addition and subtraction of related numbers were a mere sidelight to the game they really had in mind when they set out. All that zoo stuff was just a pasted on theme in order to get you to play the real game. The game of pathmaking. You could call it Pathfinder if that wasn't already taken, but it is. In any case, it turns out that Planet Zoo's pathmaking system is so complicated, you just about can't get a straight line out of it. Nor can you neatly connect two paths to each other in a way that doesn't result in some sort of four-leaf clover interchange of foot traffic loops. It's ridiculously terrible. So bad that we quit playing the game altogether after spending two solid hours looking up videos and tutorials made by fans of the game that supposedly explain the intricacies of pathmaking in an effort to try to understand how it was all meant to work. Just so we could lay a stone path from point A to point B in the simplest, most reliable manner possible without accidentally summoning a great old one from beyond time and space. None of it helped, and it's fair to say that few, if any, of the people we tried to apprentice under actually understood the system themselves. We never would have started the game if we'd known we needed to be a mason first. This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. 
picture yourself once again back in prehistory. It's a place we like to go on this show because so many interesting and fundamental things happened then, and understanding them might lead to some insights on how things work today. You live, in this example, on one of the three Arn Islands, either Inishmoor, Inishman, or Inishir. Your choice, really. The islands sit off the coast of Galway Bay in Ireland and are made of limestone. The weather is generally terrible, and because the islands are exposed barren hunks of rock, they get the full brunt of any sort of Atlantic storm that happens to blow by. The big horizontal sheets of limestone of which the island are comprised tend not to hold any topsoil, so trees aren't really a thing, wood is scarce. You basically have to think of the surface of the islands as a lot of naturally occurring pavement to get a proper idea of just how bleak things are. What are you doing there? Existing, mostly, and it's a pretty tough existence. You really aren't here because you want to be. You're here because it's the last place you can go and be safe from attack by someone with more access to pointy sticks than a belligerent attitude. But because there's no trees to speak of, and what little soil there is keeps blowing away every time the wind comes up, you've got a problem. Well, several problems, really, but let's focus on the big three. You've got some water because storms bring rain, but you've got very little food and virtually no shelter. If you want to grow anything, you have to make the dirt you grow it in yourself. To do so, you mix up the island's few natural resources, seaweed and sand, with the one thing every animal produces, manure. One of the sub-problems of the major problems listed is that there are very few animals here that aren't you and a collection of butterflies and moths, and butterflies aren't going to be very helpful in that department. So you pile up the homemade dirt as best you can, but every time the wind comes up, off it goes, either to some other part of the island where you don't want it to be, or if you are particularly unlucky, straight back out to sea. You've got to do something to stop it happening, and the only thing you have to stop it with is rocks. Meanwhile, you've also got that whole lack of shelter thing to worry about too, because the storms and wind are no better for you than they are for the soil. And again, all you've got to work with are stones. Probably it doesn't take very long for you to work out what to do with what you have. It's likely the first Aran Islanders would have started simply enough by piling stones one atop the other in a loose fashion, just hoping to keep some of the wind off themselves and off their soil. It might have been a loose wall of stone at first, a few feet high, just tall enough to lie down behind while the wind blew through the holes, which was not great, but certainly better than it had been when there were no walls at all. Eventually, though, you'd get tired of the breeze whistling at you through the gaps in the wall, and you'd start plugging those up with smaller stones and mud. You'd take these slightly improved walls and pile up your future garden along them, surrounding each plot with walls to keep the soil in place, and pile it deep enough to actually grow stuff in. Meanwhile, you'd build some huts using more stone. They'd be circular, and probably you'd dig the bottom stones in a bit and lean the rest in on themselves to keep the whole thing standing. Bits of moss and mud and stone would plug the gaps until you had something at least solid enough to keep the fire from blowing out of an evening. And pretty soon, before you knew it, you'd have invented one of the first and earliest forms of stone masonry in the world, even before the Egyptians and their fancy schmancy pyramids, which is exactly what was discovered on the Aran Islands. Dun Ingus sits atop Inish Moor. It's a prehistoric hill fort set at the edge of a 330-foot-high cliff. The best guess for the date of construction is sometime in the Bronze Age for the earliest parts of the structure. The basic means of initial construction was to pile what amounted to rubble up against large upright stones. There was no mortar used. Everything was fitted dry and by hand in a method referred to as dry stone. The early islanders made four concentric walls this way, and later additions included a triple wall defense system on the western side of the fort, which includes a densely packed area of semi-upright stones intended to act as a physically impassable barrier for any mounted riders that might happen by. Some of the still existing stonework is 12 to 13 feet wide, which is a heck of a lot of stone when you stop to think about it. But when stone is all you have on an island made of stones, it's not that hard to come by. In all, they used enough stone to encompass an area equivalent to 14 acres, and there are four more forts like it on the islands. Incidentally, 
while you're visiting the islands, tourism now being their main source of income, maybe stop by Temple Brecon, a church constructed of the same dry stone technique during the 8th to 13th centuries. Yes, all of them. Of course, we do have to deal with the Egyptians and their fancy schmancy pyramids, because everyone is quite impressed with those pyramids and makes such a big deal about them. And if you want to talk about stonemasons, they're pretty much the go-to example. Except, let's take a quick pop quiz, just to make sure we're all on the right page. For fairness's sake, we're going to exclude all modern pyramids, say anything made after 1901. And no fair looking things up before you answer, just do it off the top of your head. Ready? Question 1. What is the oldest known pyramid? Got your answer? Good. Was it the Djoser Step Pyramid in the Saqqara Necropolis in Egypt? That's a good answer. An even better answer, and the correct one though, would be no one knows for sure. Not since the settlement of Corral was discovered in the Soup Valley of Peru. That's right, Peru. Inhabited between the 26th and 20th centuries BCE, it is the oldest known urban site in all the Americas. They think. There are some other contenders around Peru, but Corral seems to have the strongest claim. It has about 20 pyramids that were built as early as 2700 BCE, while Imhotep, Pharaoh Djoser's counselor, ordered his pyramid built starting in about 2630 BCE. As these things are reckoned, that's too close to call. Next question. Which pyramid is the world's newest? And remember, we're not including anything post-1900. If you said the pyramids of Guimar, give yourself a point. Built in the 19th century, the pyramids of Guimar are dry stone pyramids made by piling up lava stone pulled from fields in and around Tenerife on the Canary Islands of Spain. They caused quite the stir in the 1990s thanks to global adventurer Thor Heyerdahl, who had long thought there was a link between Egypt and Central America, with Tenerife being a stopping off spot on the way between the two. As it turns out, the most likely explanation for these step pyramids is that locals plowing their fields over the years would pile up any stones they turned up until they had six pyramids worth of loose rocks. These pyramids were dated based on several clues found while excavating around them, not the least of which was an official seal from 1848. Okay, one more question. What pyramid is the biggest? We're going to guess a bunch of you spotted this as particularly easy and immediately provided the right answer. The Great Pyramid of Cholula. No, no, see, the Great Pyramid of Giza is merely the tallest of the old school pyramids at 481 feet. Now granted, Cholula is a mere 216 feet tall, but where it really scores over Giza is in its sheer area and volume. Cholula's base is 1,480 feet to a side, giving it a total interior volume of 91,227,000 and change cubic feet, the largest of any known pyramid in the world. The total construction time of it and the complex in which it sits is at least 1,000 years. It's made of six superimposed constructions, one for each ethnic group that at one point owned it. Its base covers three times more area than that of Giza. And with that out of the way, let's get on to the important stuff. Of course, the only thing anyone really cares about when discussing pyramids is how they were built. Now, before any of you begin jumping up and down and forwarding us memes of that fuzzy-headed guy from the increasingly inaccurately named History Channel, let us just say, don't. It wasn't aliens. It just wasn't. Mostly they were built by sheer brute force. Throw enough people at anything and you can even build pyramids. Sure, at the time the Egyptian pyramids were built, they didn't have the wheel and pulley. But they had levers and inclined planes and wedges, and that is, by all accounts, sufficient if you have enough people with which to work them. And the Egyptians did. The real debate of the how of pyramids is whether what they had was several thousand slaves to do all the work, or whether they just had a few thousand slaves and several thousand skilled laborers with which to make it all work. Those skilled craftsmen would have been essential. 
they'd have been paid proper wages or allowed to work off debt in exchange for their services. It's doubtful slave labor alone could have produced pyramids with quite the same quality without them. You needed people who knew how to do specific things, and most of the specific things people needed to know how to do involved working with stone. From what kind of stone to use for various parts of the pyramid, to how to cut the stone in preparation for removal from the dig site, to preparing the stone to be put into a specific place which it had to fit pretty much the first time because no one was going to haul the stone up and down the pyramid more than once if you got it off by just a little bit. All of this work was directed by a master mason or two who each oversaw groups of thousands of men. Coordinating what was going on as well as how it was going on was a daunting task. Which was the whole point of master masons. Knowing everything there was to know about stones and different types of rock was the core of their business. Getting it wrong could have catastrophic consequences and because of that, you didn't just wake up one morning and get hired on as a master mason. Most modern-day Masons serve at least a three-year apprenticeship, during which time they learn on-site and on-the-job under the watchful eye of the instructor. But that isn't all. Today there's theory work and general knowledge. You learn to cut stone and lay stone, you learn to read blueprints and do drafting, you'll need math skills, and you'll participate in electronic stone masonry training, which is not, as far as we can make out, all-night Minecraft sessions. During your training period, you'll become familiar with the tools of the trade, naturally. Mallets, and chisels, and metal straight edges are the bare bones basics. With those three tools, you can shape a block of stone so that it has flat, even sides. And that doesn't even take into account the pneumatic tools now in use, or even the very old ways of splitting stone. You'll also have to learn how to mix mortar properly, of course, and you'll need a trowel to lay it on the stones and fit it into the gaps. And mortar is funny stuff. It's designed to be weaker than the stone or brick it is holding in place, because if something breaks, you want it to be the mortar, which is cheap and easy to repair or replace, instead of the stone, which is not easy to replace and very expensive. If mortar breaks, you just slather in more. If stone breaks, you have to not only replace the stone with something that nearly exactly fits the space left behind, you also may have to take apart, brick by brick, a section of wall just to put one piece back in place properly. The earliest mortars known were just mud and clay. As civilization advanced, things got a little more sophisticated, and the Babylonians were making baked brick constructions held together with lime or pitch. Later advances were made into gypsum-based mortar, which you may know as plaster of Paris, and is the stuff used by ancient stonemasons to hold the pyramids together. Thank goodness it doesn't rain a lot in Egypt, because plaster of Paris tends to soak in water and fall apart. Eventually, as the Greeks worked out concrete, they came up with something called pozzolanic mortar, which was made from volcanic ash that reacted with water and calcium hydroxide to form a cement-like compound. And nowadays, we call that substance hydraulic cement because it hardens under water. Unfortunately, something happened, no one knows what exactly, and we all forgot how to make cement and hydraulic mortar. 2,000 years it took before anyone worked it out again. Until then, we just had to use basic lime mortar on all the medieval Gothic cathedrals, which notably does not do well in damp or rainy conditions, and is one of the significant reasons that some cathedrals aren't in such great shape. Fortunately, in 1794, Joseph Aspden tossed a bunch of limestone and clay into a kiln, heated it all up to produce nodules called clinker, then ground that down and added gypsum to it to come up with what is called ordinary Portland cement so named because it was ordinary, and reminded folks of the Portland stone quarried from the island of Portland in Dorset, England. It sets hard and dries quickly, and is generally less of a hassle to deal with when making shiny new stone and brick buildings. Nowadays, though, you can get all sorts of fancy colors and polymers in your mortar, depending on what you need to do with it. And all of that is what a mason needs to know just about the mortar they are using. Back in medieval times, a stonemason had to learn most of that the hard way, by doing it instead of just reading about it, which is why apprenticeships for masons back then were as long as seven years, during which time you had to learn not just about mortar, but about the stone you would be using as well. Everything from granite to pumice to marble, slate, sandstone, and limestone were on the syllabus, and you had to know when, where, and why to use them. 
Granite is exceptionally hard, strong, and durable, making for great counters and flooring, but not so hot for detailed decorative bits. Marble was fine and easy to work, great for decoration and art as demonstrated by the Greeks, but you only have to look at the Acropolis to realize it wasn't maybe the best choice for structural integrity. Slate is very fine-grained stone and holds very sharp details, which is what makes it ideal for memorials and headstones, but also means it splits nicely to make slate roofing tiles. Masons who specialized particularly in doing headstones and memorials are called, naturally enough, memorial masons, because any industry that has been around as long as masonry has, has developed specific areas in which one can specialize. Masons who particularly focus on the application of stone onto buildings using a variety of specialized mortar and equipment are called fixer masons. Quarry men split sheets of rock and pull them from the ground. Sawyers, as the name suggests, cut rough blocks of stone into cubes of the project's required size. Banker masons work out of a workshop and shape the stones into the variety of shapes needed for a given building, including detailed moldings in the delicate tracery for Gothic windows. And carvers make statues and other artistic figures. Modern stone masons will receive some training in all of these aspects of their job. And those are really just the beginning of all the things they have to know about stonemasonry, just to make the move from apprentice to journeyman, where they could stop learning all the theory and book stuff, and finally get out there and begin to earn a living. In medieval times, you'd have spent your time essentially working for free as you learned your trade at the foot of your master. Once you graduated to journeyman, though, you were allowed to earn a daily wage and take jobs offered to you as a fully qualified craftsman for someone else. Eventually, if you were good enough and worked hard enough, you could become a master mason and were considered a free man, able to go where you liked, work for whomever wanted to be your patron, and train apprentices of your own. And then, you could travel to the home of Planet Zoo developers Frontier Developments and show them that laying a stone path in a straight line is just about the easiest thing you can do, and doesn't need seven years of study to figure out. You've been listening to GM Word of the Week, and we're glad you did. We really were genuinely annoyed with the pathling in Planet Zoo, but at least now we've got it out of our system and you got an episode out of it. Cool, huh? That's how this has worked about half the time over the years. We get annoyed about something, go looking for a solution, and find something interesting to talk about and share with you. It seems to work, so we'll probably keep at it that way for the foreseeable future. This week's shout out goes to B Miller 75 who left a lovely Canadian Apple podcast review. We sometimes all the time forget to check other countries review pages because Apple doesn't make it easy. We're going to put more effort into remembering that. And good old B Miller here is the first step in that direction. Thanks for the review. And thanks to all our Canadian listeners for listening. Some of our favorite TV shows of old came from Canada and certainly a lot of our current favorite music. You're doing something right up there. If you'd like to help support the show, you can do so by following the little yellow banner at the top of the show's website at gmwordoftheweek.com. Supporters on Patreon get some nice little additional bonuses for their support. And thanks to everyone who already helps out there. We don't even have to consider running ads with your contributions. That's pretty cool. GM Word of the Week is researched, written, and produced by me, Brian Casey, Reluctant Apprentice Mason. Music for this week's show came from our friends at Blue Dot Sessions. The wisdom of the journeyman is to work one day at a time, and he always said that any job, even if it took years, was made up out of a day's work. Nothing more, nothing less.